Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to be talking about the various characteristics that all living things have. So the characteristics of life. The first one is that all living things are made of cells. You may hear this described as all living things are cellular, and there are two types of cellularity. There are organisms that are unicellular. We often think of bacteria as being the major unicellular life forms, but there are also unicellular archaea and unicellular eukaryotes. There are also many forms of life that are multicellular, meaning made of multiple cells. Animals, for example, are multicellular. And in particular, in multicellular organisms, we have something known as specialization. That is, cells that are specialized for different functions within the multicellular organism. If we use human beings as an example, human beings have brain cells, blood cells, heart cells, kidney cells, skin cells, eye cells, lung cells, etc. Many, many different types of cells that all have specialized function that contribute to the overall health and functioning of the multicellular organism. Characteristic number two is that living things are able to reproduce. And there are two types of reproduction. There is asexual reproduction where the daughter organism is genetically identical to the parent organism. This is called a clone. Bacteria reproduce asexually, specifically through a process known as binary fission. If you're interested in learning more about how bacteria divide and about this process of binary fission, please see my video on that topic. There's also sexual reproduction. This is how animals reproduce, as well as many other types of organisms. So for example, this is when a gamete from one organism and a gamete from another organism meet, for example, when a sperm fertilizes an egg, and the offspring is genetically different from both parents because the offspring has genetic information from both parents. So that is sexual reproduction. The next thing that distinguishes living organisms is the use of DNA for genetic information. Information in living cells follows a certain path. It is stored in DNA. It is then sent through RNA to make proteins. And so this movement of genetic information from DNA to RNA to proteins is an important concept in biology. It's actually known as the central dogma of molecular biology. And if you're interested in learning more about the central dogma, please see my video on that topic. I do want to mention one exception. There are viruses that use DNA as their genetic information, but there are also viruses that can use RNA as their genetic information. However, viruses are not considered living things. They're considered to be intracellular obligate parasites. They're basically like little molecular machines made of just a bit of protein and a bit of either RNA or DNA. So they are not alive, and thus we can still say that DNA as the genetic information is a characteristic of all living things. Another characteristic is the use of a universal genetic code. And the fact that the genetic code is universal is an important piece of evidence in the fact that all life evolved from the same common ancestor. In the universal genetic code, there is a language. And in this language, the words are basically codons. So the codons are series of three nucleotides that code for an amino acid. So remember that nucleotides make up DNA and RNA, amino acids make up proteins, and so with this universal genetic code, the nucleotides in RNA code for specific amino acids and proteins. So for example, the codon AUG 
or adenine, uracil, guanine, always codes for methionine. So whenever there is this codon in RNA, the protein that is made incorporates a methionine in its place. And so this genetic code is used by all living organisms. Living organisms can also grow and they can develop. And these may sound like the same thing, but really there are some important differences. Growth refers to increasing in size, either because the cell itself grows in size or because the organism is acquiring new cells through mitosis, and so you're getting an overall change in size of the organism. Development refers to a change in shape or, most importantly, a change in function. And it's this development process that leads to specialization. That is, as organisms develop, their different cells, when they're multicellular organisms, can acquire different types of specialization, leading to an overall developed organism. Another characteristic of living things is their ability to adapt to their environment. This occurs through something known as natural selection. This is because in any population, there are individuals who have different genetic signatures, so different types of genes, different mutations, and some of these may be more or less favorable depending on the environment. And so over time, this allows populations to evolve. So, natural selection leads to evolution of populations. It's important for you to understand that individuals do not evolve. Individuals are either more or less suited to their environment based on their genes. Those that are more suited to their environment are more likely to survive, which makes them more likely to reproduce, which makes them more likely to pass on their genes to the next generation. This means that over time, populations can evolve as favorable traits become a larger part of the population and unfavorable traits are selected against. So that is the ability of organisms to adapt to their environment at the level of populations. The next characteristic of living things is their ability to use energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. Organisms have to do all kinds of work that they need energy for. Individual cells have to be able to signal to each other, they have to be able to take nutrients in, they have to be able to expel waste products, and at the multicellular level, organisms have to be able to do all kinds of work. They have to be able to find food, they have to be able to make shelter, they have to be able to outrun predators, they have to be able to grow and develop. These are all things that require energy. And how do cells get energy? Well, it's through the process of metabolism, and specifically, through cellular respiration, which generates something called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's often called the energy currency of the cell. This molecule is how the cells release energy that is stored in chemical bonds for the cell's use when it's needed. If you are interested in learning more about aerobic respiration during which ATP is made, please see my video on that topic. The next characteristic of living things is their ability to respond to the environment. For example, phototropism is when plants grow towards light. A reflex arc is when you touch something sharp or touch something hot and the signal doesn't even have to make it to your brain before you're pulling your hand away. These are both examples of responding to the present environment, and this is something that living things can do. Unicellular organisms can do it too. For example, bacteria can display something known as chemotropism. 
This is when they can move towards chemicals that would be used as nutrients, or they can move away from chemicals that might be harmful. So it is the attraction to these chemicals known as chemotropism and the movement toward or away from these chemicals known as chemotaxis. These are both examples of how unicellular organisms respond to their current environment. And finally, the last characteristic of living things we're going to talk about is their ability to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is kind of a big word that simply means the physiological steady state conditions. For example, unicellular organisms, they want to maintain their tonicity inside their cells versus the external environment. And they have ways to do this that involves bringing solutes in or bringing water in or sending solutes out whatever is needed to make sure they have the proper tonicity. Examples in multicellular organisms include things like thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is a way that organisms maintain their body temperature as needed for their specific type of metabolism. So for example, things like shivering and sweating are things that help to maintain the body temperature, to help maintain the physiological steady state that the organism needs to be healthy and functional. Another example is something like the excretory system. The excretory system is what helps to expel wastes from animal bodies. Without being able to expel wastes, they would build up in the body. This would be very unfavorable, very unhealthy for animals. So the excretory system helps to get rid of those wastes. Unicellular organisms as well have different types of, of ways to get rid of wastes. For example, things like exocytosis or even different types of channel proteins that allow things that are no longer needed to be expelled from the cell. So here you have it, the various characteristics of living things. I hope you learned a lot and thanks for watching Biology Professor.